this action by Yukon government has basically kicked a sleeping giant. And I think the Yukon government needs to be aware of two pressures that are going to be exerted on them, and that is the unification of all Yukon First Nations are going to come together on this because it affects them as well as us. I think this is a profound test of uh, whether the, the, the new constitutional settlement in the North, extending over the last 25 years, uh, is going to be um, uh, is going to be upheld or not. Uh, and that's the purpose of this lawsuit, whether governments are obliged to live up to those land claims agreements, entrenched, as I say, in the Constitution of Canada. Now, a commission was established called the Peel Commission, uh, jointly by the government of Yukon and the First Nations in 2004. The Peel Commission spent seven years and consulted widely with Yukoners, and in 2009 recommended that 80% of the Peel watershed be protected and 20% be open for oil and gas and mineral development. After due consideration, the government of Yukon decided that it would not reject it, but would simply propose certain modifications to the recommended plan. Now that was a choice binding on the government of Yukon. The Peel watershed is one of the last remaining ecologically intact wilderness watersheds left in North America. It's over seven times the size of Yellowstone National Park. People travel from all over the world to paddle these wild rivers in the Peel watershed and to experience this vast landscape which, where nature unfolds as it has since time immemorial. The public wants to see this area protected Government says their plan is balanced, but where is the balance when you consider that more than 80% of this vast, wild place that is so important to First Nations and the public is open for business? Is it really so much to ask that some priceless places remain free of roads and industrial development? The Peel watershed is worth so much more for cultural values, wildlife, as a carbon sink, as a refuge from climate change, and for wilderness tourism than it is for mining. The Trondequichin are not against responsible mining <clears throat> and responsible industrial development. We have lived closely with mining for over 100 years. Many of my people are miners or work in the mining industry. We have excellent relationships with mining companies that we work hard to maintain. That said, we do not want to see mining in the Peel watershed. To us, that land and water is sacred and should be preserved for future generations. Gotta be preserved for future generations. As our elders say, the Peel is our church, our university, and our breadbasket. It feeds our spirit, our minds, and our bodies. In exchange for the promises in our final agreement, the First Nation of Lake Dunn agreed to cede, release, and surrender our Aboriginal title to all non-settlement land within our traditional territory. We gave up title to 95% of our land as part of the treaty process. Number two, the Yukon government's unilateral decision to accept their own land use plan has now thrown seven years of hard work in land use planning out the window. This constitutionally entrenched planning process produced an acceptable land use plan to all stakeholders except this new Yukon government. Nashnaik Dunn initially wanted 100% of the Peel protected. We compromised and settled for 80% being protected. We further compromised and agreed to an additional 25% of the Peel being open for review in 10 years' time. The final recommended plan that we support protects 55% of the Peel. I would say that 100% protection that we initially started off with, down to potentially 55% of the appeal being protected, is a significant compromise by all stakeholders. There is just no way in this world we can allow the territorial government to do what they want with our homelands. We have a fair say in it, we have an honest say, and we will say our piece and make sure that we are heard, Masih.